yes, yes, I plan to let this snake go soon and um, see how it reacts to your warm bodies. So, uh, so more than just, yeah, this one will bite. So, you know, guaranteed. And it has very long teeth. So um, I put a ton of slides in here. I may have to skip over some things, but what I wanted to do is give you a sort of an overview of the kind of things that we do in my research lab, which is right across the way here, beyond the palm tree, out the front door here. We have a lab full of pit vipers, pythons, boas, and a few other kinds of snakes. In fact, most of the, well, all of the photographs I think you'll see in here are animals that we either have right now over there or have had over there in the very recent past. So um, I wanna take you on, as I say here, a trip through the snake brain, and you'll see why a trip is uh, written that way very soon. There's a particular molecule that we're very interested in now. So what this is going to be is, um, I'll give you a little overview, tell you about generally what it is we study in these snakes, what it, what it means that they actually see the world in infrared. So then what I want to do is show you some real examples of that, snake behavior, how they operate. And then we'll dive down to the molecular level and wander our way through the brain and see how this system is built in these, uh, is a very unusual system. And the only place it exists is in these snakes. And then we'll come back out to the behavioral level before we wrap up. So hopefully you'll find this fun and interesting. And if the snake does happen to get out, maybe it'll even be exciting. So um, I usually bring a snake and I'll have it out and I'll tell people that there were two, so if you see the other one. But I, I snuck in late, so I don't get to do that with you guys. Um, so I actually grew up loving snakes, believe it or not. I grew up in the middle of nowhere out in the countryside and had all sorts of pets from uh, rabbits to birds to, and these are wild animals. I had a deer that slept in my bed until she got too big and there just wasn't room for the, both of us. Possums, raccoons. Um, Snakes were actually one of the few things that I was afraid of when I was very young, but um, I remember getting over it one day. I, I literally asked myself when I was about seven years old, why am I afraid of this animal and I love all of these others? And um, I changed uh, with vengeance. I suppose. May, neither my mother or my father really liked snakes at all. In fact, they were really terrified of them. I could tell you a number of stories where they almost died of heart attacks or they almost killed me because snakes loose in the house or um, I didn't sneak up behind them with a snake but rather I would come rushing in and say look what I found and they would turn around and go oh my god and I really think I nearly killed my dad one time um, so anyway snakes have fascinated people generally and I put a few examples here uh, there's a an ancient Greek coin in the upper left and the lower right is a Victorian pen my wife happens to have a lot of snake jewelry I, I know she wishes she had that piece the one in the center is very special to me. I spent a summer in Australia, had great time chasing some amazing snakes over there. That's actually one of the mythical creatures from what the aboriginals call the dream time. It's the rainbow serpent and it's credited for being the, 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 the basis for all of the riverways and the lakes. They said wherever this giant snake crawled across the landscape, it left these, um, uh, you know, rifts between hills and mountains that water now flows through and wherever the snake curled up to sleep at night that's where lakes formed so a lot of interest in snakes over the course of history uh, this is one i put in just for fun if anybody happens to be a history buff out there this is a political cartoon that i found from the time of the american revolutionary war and this is a giant serpent that's meant to represent those horrible colonists over there in the New World. And the American snake has these three big coils, and it's got two garrisons of British soldiers entrapped in the first two coils. And the tail here has a sign hanging on it that says, an apartment to let for military gentlemen. In other words, we've got room for more. This was actually a British cartoon that was uh, designed to, you know, poke fun at the British government and say, we really need to get out of there and leave those people alone because this is just becoming too much of a problem for us. And of course, snakes are always vilified as this, you know, horrible monster. Um, what I'll tell you about tonight is one example of something that's very fascinating about snakes. And it turns out that they really are fascinating animals in so many ways they are the source of quite a few 
medications, cardiovascular medi medications, for example. People who've studied venoms to try to understand how venoms work have, real worked, have realized that components, molecular components of snake venoms, and it turns out venoms from a lot of other animals, have medicinal properties, pharmacological properties that we can take advantage of. Rattlesnake tail muscle is the single most energy efficient muscle known on the planet. So if you want to study the physiology of muscle and energy consumption and efficiency in biological systems, great, great system. Um, pythons have been used as models for studying digestion and understanding our own evolution and why it is that in today's society we can easily gain weight so, so rapidly. It's because, you know, we've, we've we evolved in a time of lean, and now we live in a time of plenty. Our physiology is adapted for gaining as many nutrients as we can. This understanding actually came out of studies utilizing pythons because they swallow these giant meals whole and digest them very rapidly, so they were a great model system to study the physiology of digestion. Anyway, I got my start as a graduate student at Emory University's School of Medicine studying vision. And I've studied a variety of aspects of vision, and in fact, in my lab, we still do in some other interesting animals, including fish like tarpon, bonefish, and eels, all the way to whales, uh, marine turtles. But um, the, the, the point I want to make here is there are a lot of different kinds of eyes. There are a lot of different apparent kinds of eyes, different structures and different ways that they're built on the inside, but they all do one thing. They form a map in the brain of visual space. Photons come in, you get an image of those photons on the back of the eye, and then there's a spatial conservation between that image on the back of the eye and the wiring in the brain. There is literally a map in your brain of visual space in front of your head. Literally a map in your brain based on this conserved wiring from the retina to the brain. So, a lot of time spent looking at visual systems, but what I had to train myself to do when I first started working on this infrared sensory system was to really understand what it was I was looking at, or maybe more specifically, what it is these snakes are looking at. Um, this one's actually watching the screen, it appears. So at least he's interested. So visible light, as probably we all know, occupies a very narrow spectrum of the, a very narrow region of the entire electromagnetic spectrum we say on a wavelength basis from about 400 to 700 nanometers. Now does anybody know how that's defined? What is it, why do we say that those are the limits? 400 to 700 nanometers. It's because what we can see, we're very egocentric as a species. 400 to 700 nanometers is what we can see. Other animals see a little farther into the ultraviolet, some see a little farther into the infrared, but despite that, all animals see roughly what we call visible light with their eyes. If you go into the ultraviolet, we're talking about shorter wavelengths, higher energy photons, photons that can be damaging. This is why we wear sunscreen, right? If you go out into the infrared, we're talking about longer wavelengths and lower energy photons. So I tend to think of, and I don't know if this is really an accurate way of thinking, but I, but I believe so, that visible light represents a compromise between photons that are energetic enough that the molecular systems that biology uses can detect them, can pick up that energy, versus photons that are so energetic that they're damaging to biological material like DNA. So we all, all of us vertebrate animals, mice, rats, people, horses, all of us see roughly 400 to 700 nanometers. These snakes have eyes and they can see visible light. But in addition, I'll show you that they have these specialized organs called pit organs that detect infrared radiation. But what I'll show you is that it's not this near infrared radiation that some other vertebrate animals can pick up. It's actually very far away. We believe that the peak absorption of this system in these snakes is around 10 microns. 400 to 700 nanometers is visible. 10 microns is 10,000 nanometers. 400 to 700 or 400 to 700 versus 10,000. This is way out in the infrared. For a biochemical system to do this is really astounding. There's nothing else like this literally anywhere on Earth. So we're interested in how this works. 
and how do these animals utilize it? As a biologist, I'm really interested in the animal and how it uses it. But there are some very interesting practical applications as well. So if anybody knows anything about black body radiation, this is a set of black body radiation curves. And basically, what we're looking at is the emission spectrum of various objects at different temperatures. And as these objects get hotter and hotter and hotter, their peak emission goes to shorter and shorter wavelengths. So sort of ghosted here is the visible spectrum. And does anybody know what this yellow color represents? The sun. That's the sun. So a very hot object emits maximally in this region that we call visible. Works out very well for us. Another good reason why we detect visible light. It's what the sun emits. If that object emitting whatever it's emitting, if it, it's cooled and cooled and cooled, you can see that these curves basically follow, fall off on this short end. So this would be analogous to having a, an incandescent light bulb on a rheostat. And you turn it down, turn it down, turn it down. It goes from apparently white, because you're seeing all of those uh, wavelengths of the visible spectrum, to maybe uh, sort of yellowish, to orange, to red, and eventually you see that thin red filament, and then it glows dimmer and dimmer, very, very red, and finally disappears. Not ceasing to emit radiation, everything above absolute zero emits radiation. So this curve at about 300 degrees Kelvin, and I just picked 300 for a round number, so that's about 27 degrees Celsius, close enough to 37. What's 37 degrees Celsius? us. Our core body temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius. So this is our emission, way out uh, beyond visible. There's, we don't emit visible light, but we still emit radiation. And interestingly, the emission of an object that's around 300 degrees Kelvin, or around our body temperature, emits maximally around 10 microns, which is exactly where we believe that these snakes are detecting. Makes sense. These snakes target, at least in the cartoons and in the movies, they target mice and rats and people. Depends on what kind of movie you watch. So, um, so it makes sense. So there are other animals that detect infrared radiation, quite a few. Beetles. There's a type of beetle called a fire beetle that actually lays its eggs in the wood of recently burned trees. And we believe it has this specialized organ on its underside that helps them find uh, wood with about the right temperature, warm enough that it helps them, you know, find a, a suitable laying spot, but not so hot that the eggs are going to get toasted, or the beetles for that matter. Um, vampire bats have infrared detectors they use to find a meal. We don't think long range, but very short range. They land on the back of a cow and they scan the surface of the cow looking for a blood vessel of about the right size based upon its temperature. Well, this animal is pretty interesting. They live along these hydrothermal vents in the very deep ocean where it's very, very cold, except next to those hydrothermal vents. The thermal gradient is tremendously rapid, and it goes from very, very cold to extremely hot in a matter of centimeters. Not only is there heat there where animals could live, there's also a lot of nutrients load there as well. So a lot of the things that are coming out of these black smokers are taken in by some microorganisms and those microorganisms feed larger things and ultimately things like these shrimp can live there. This is an actual photograph taken in the from the deep sea sub Alvin out in the Atlantic and showing lots of these shrimp right alongside this black smoker. Um, these two organs on the surface of this animal are photon detectors. They're infrared detectors. They're called exoculata because they don't have eyes. They're, say again? Um, they're about normal size, if I remember correctly, about normal size. You know, the size of shrimp that we eat, typically. Um, I've never seen one in person myself, so that's a, that's a good question, but that's what I've always thought is they're about. Anyway, they don't have normal eyes, the normal eye that a shrimp has, but they do have these two spots on the back that people called eye spots. And not too long ago, someone actually analyzed this to determine whether these are, in fact, photon detectors, and they can utilize them to, to modulate how close or how far they get from those black smokers. And it turns out that they are. But they're very different from what I'll show you in these snakes. This system 
utilizes the same kind of biochemistry to detect photons that we use in our eyes and shrimp use in their eyes. Same kind of biochemistry. I'll tell you a little bit about that. But um, the short of it is snakes do it very, very differently. So that's one of the take-home messages that I'll show you some data to, to illustrate that. So there are other animals that can detect IR, but we're talking near IR, very uh, relatively high energy photons, very close to visible. Um, some rodents can, for example. Um, but these snakes are something very different. This is an Australian carpet python, and I should have put these photos in a different order because you probably know pit vipers better if you know snakes at all. But in these pythons, they actually have, and, and many boas too, they have an array of these heat sensing or infrared sensing pit organs. So each one of these little things here, these sort of roundish depressions, are these thermosensors. There's also an array that's, that's right on the upper edge of the lower jaw. This is the jawline here. On the upper jaw, there's also an array of sort of slit-like pit organs. One here, one here, one here. There's a very small one there. And there's also some more of these very small sort of pinpoint ones along the, the lower jaw as well. So they have this array of these heat-sensing organs around the, the upper and lower jaw. Some have very few, some have many, many, as many as 40 of these organs. Pit vipers, on the other hand, this is a timber rattlesnake. They live all up and down the Appalachian region. They have two very large facial pit organs. This is not the nostril. The nostril is actually right about here, and it's fairly laterally oriented. But this big hole is a pit organ. This is the heat sensor, the thermal sensor, the infrared sensor of this animal. This is one of my favorite animals we have right across the, the way there. So what do they do with them? This is a series of images. I didn't want to trust the video. It's, it's gigantic in size. Uh, this is from a very high sensitivity, very high speed infrared video camera that we used in filming uh, a show for National Geographic a year or so ago. And this is a water moccasin that we caught along the St. John's River. And we were actually doing this experiment out there in the dark, in the middle of the night. It was a little scary um, when we, you turn off all the lights and you don't really know where the snake is. And I'm standing here above this wooden box that we built with a piece of fishing line with a water balloon hanging from the end of it, swinging it back and forth in front of this snake while my colleagues um, videotaped the animal's response. So the balloon is approximately mouse temperature, about 37 degrees C. So in this infrared sensitive camera, it shows up as a very bright object. This is the snake, and now I can't really see. Oh, this is, um, we've, this frame is actually after the snake has already begun to initiate its strike. This is the top of the head, this is the lower jaw, its mouth is open. And in this frame, he's actually hit the balloon. He actually, boy, they mean business. When they hit it, they grab onto it and just wrench that balloon. You can feel it. I couldn't see the snake, but I sure could feel it when he hit it. And now he's pulled back away from the balloon and, and finally ret uh, retreating away from the balloon. This camera is so sensitive, actually, that you can see the change in the temperature inside the snake's mouth. It's very cool here, and it's relatively warm afterwards where he's picked up uh, heat from the balloon. And the balloon actually has an imprint, a heat imprint, of the snake's rows of teeth on it. So um, they do have two big fangs, but they also have these four rows of teeth on the top and two rows on the bottom. So um, this is done at night, in the dark. The snake wasn't blindfolded. We many times blindfold our snakes even. Um, but the snake had absolutely no trouble detecting this object. It's, it's so amazing that I've seen using an infrared viewer. I've seen boas in Central America hanging from the roof of caves in pitch blackness. And as bats begin to leave that cave in the evening, and they're flying full speed out of that cave. These snakes strike out and literally snatch a fast-moving bat right out of midair. So they're doing this all with these heat sensors. So really an amazing system. I don't know of anything else that gives animals this kind of power. Um, we'll skip that one. We'll go on to something more interesting. People. <laughs> I always love this thing. I, I've seen this for years, ever since I was, uh, I don't know, at least a teenager, I suppose. But when, uh, 
when I started doing this work, I said, oh my gosh, I've got to use that cartoon. So they do have uh, this, this, uh, this, this amazing sensory system. I don't know whether they teach each other how to operate it, but uh, they're, they're quite good at it. They seem born very good at it. Um, so what I want to tell you about to begin with is a, a little bit about how they utilize these two sensory systems together, and then we're going to dive into the pit organ itself and talk about how the system might operate from a molecular level to a neuroscience level, how the system is wired into the brain. So they do have eyes, they do have pit organs, and again, this is only in boas, pythons, and pit vipers. Not even any other snakes in the world have this, exclusive to these animals. We've actually looked very carefully at some other big African vipers that we thought might have it, but it is very, very restricted to these two, really, boas and pythons, one group, pit vipers is another, two very unusual types of snakes. Um, vast array of other types of snakes don't have it. Again, this, this is a western diamondback rattlesnake. This is a Burmese python. Here you can really see these uh, upper jaw slit-like pit organs very well. But in both cases, what we know based upon some electrophysio electrophysiology, meaning recording electrical activity in the brain, that they both are imaging systems. Both of these systems form a, a map of the world in the brain. One a visible map, one a thermal map. Um, and because the systems are mapped in much the same way, ultimately they go to the same part of the brain, a place known as the optic tectum, and because, in a sense, the peripheral organ is built similarly, my first thought was, when I started working on this, is it's just another photoreceptor. It's, it's another light detector that somehow tweaked to make it much, much more sensitive to very low energy infrared photons. So the first thing we set out to do, oh, totally forgot. I was going to show you a little bit of behavior first. I thought I had something different in there. Um, since we saw that, that water moxin striking at that water balloon. I thought I'd tell you about this one experiment very briefly. Um, we, we were really, and this, what are these dimwits thinking came from a conference. I was, we were making jokes about this, but I don't think they're dimwits at all. A snake has a very small brain. I'll show you some images of their brain later, but they do some very complex behavior with these systems, and I'll show you some really interesting behavior later as well. But we actually started out doing some fairly simple behavioral experiments to ask some very fundamental questions. And the diagrams there are meant to illustrate an experiment we did to ask something very simple about whether or not this really is an imaging sensor. So we predicted that, well, if you think about our eyes, our eyes do a lot of things. They tell us about shape, contrast between light and dark, color, movement, all sorts of things. But really what they do, most fundamentally, is tell us about contrast, difference between light and dark. That's what visual sensors are, are all about. All the other stuff is add-on. Some animals have spectacular color vision, some animals have very poor color vision, but we all detect contrast between light and dark. So we reason that if this system is at its core the same, but it should simply be a contrast detector, the difference between warm and cool. We also reasoned that if it is a contrast detector, it shouldn't matter where the warm is and where the cool is. They should be able to detect the difference. So imagine a black wall and a white wall is moving back and forth. What would you see? Simple question. You'd see a white ball moving back and forth, right? What if, you saw, what if it was a white wall with a black ball moving black, back and forth? What would you see? You'd see a black ball moving back and forth, right? Dumb question. But that's, we, we figured if you had an object that was cooler than background moving back and forth against the background, or you had an object that was uh, warmer than background moving back and forth, the snake should be able to detect it easily. And the only thing that we should see, and the real reason we did this, is the amount of contrast should matter. There should be greater responsiveness when there's a huge contrast, warm versus cool, and lower and lower responsiveness as the difference between warm and cool became less and less. What we were really after was the limit of sensitivity in the system. How small a thermal differential can they detect? And we can talk about more about that a little later, but something really simple 
and really interesting came out of this experiment. So this is my little diagram of the way these snakes behave. These are copperheads. And we tested, I don't know, a dozen or so of these animals many, many times each. Um, and again, this is an object that's a few degrees warmer than the background temperature. We've got a big apparatus that we built and a, a computer-controlled pendulum and a Peltier element. We can set the temperature wherever we want. And the background temperature we can set wherever we want. And this is what these snakes do, exactly what you'd think they'd do. Oh, and by the way, the little, the little squares over the eyes are meant to represent the fact that this snake is blindfolded. So we've got a black object, a black background, and a blindfolded snake, so we really believe he cannot see visible contrast. When we do this, the snake will follow that movement. As this thing oscillates back and forth, he follows the movement. He also tongue flicks in phase with the movement of the object. Copperheads are really great at this. Pythons get bored pretty quickly. But these copperheads, they really stayed on it. And every now and then, they would strike at the object. And if they struck, they always hit it. In our initial experiments, before we did the Peltier device, we used water balloons. And boy, they got a big surprise when they hit one of those water balloons. But they'd follow it, they'd tongue flick at it, and when they hit it, the, uh, when they struck, they always hit it every single time. So what happened when the object was cooler than background? It was bizarre. They did exactly the opposite of what you'd expect. Every single snake, every single time. They moved in perfect antiphase with the motion of the balloon. When they tongue flick, they tongue flick where the balloon was, not where it is. And when they struck, and they did quite a few times, they always missed, every single time. Bizarre. So I better stop this before you guys get some sort of seizure or convulsion. Uh-oh, it's not going to stop. It's there forever. So the bottom line is, what we took from this is these snakes are actually hardwired to perceive the warm aspect of the thermal differential. And we thought, this is bizarre. It just doesn't make any sense. That's not what we would do. But then we thought about the way these snakes operate. What are they detecting? One bodies, potential prey, right? Mice, rats, whatever it is they're going for. And boas, pythons, and pit vipers primarily prey on warm-blooded prey. Lots of other snakes eat snails and other snakes and lizards and eggs and things like that. These animals prey almost exclusively, uh, I shouldn't say that, but most of them prey most of the time on warm-blooded prey. They also have to watch out for potential predators. And who are potential predators? Primarily birds and mammals. Primarily birds and mammals. And then the last thing they look for are thermal retreats, especially in the fall. They're looking for a warm place that might be a hibernaculum, or on a cool morning, they're looking for that warm spot of sunshine to warm up with that warm rock. So very simple experiment, very interesting behavioral result. Um, so we've got a lot of these behavioral experiments. They're a lot of fun. And I'll show you, about, I'll show you one more at the end that's a totally different kind of behavioral experiment that we just, we're, we're doing now that's really amazing. But anyway, back to how the system works. I was talking about the pit organ versus the eye, and I have a lot of experience in the, in the eye, and we have a lot of tools to study eyes. This is actually a photograph of a cross-section of an eye of a tarpon. And the red and green are labeled photoreceptors, the light-detecting cells of the retina. The red is one type, rod cells. The green is another type, the cone cells. But anyway, the, the point here is, oh, and these other things, these blue layers are layers of other types of cells that we understand do various um, functions in the processing of that visual information before it ever gets to the brain. The other photographs illustrate some of these cell types, um, a rod cell, a cone cell, and an electron micrograph. Anyway, we know a lot about the retina. So the first thing we did was go to those pit organs, looked at the anatomy. I'll just tell you, I shared lots of pictures, it looks totally different. You don't see that layered organization. You don't see a single cell anywhere that's shaped like these photoreceptors. And I'll tell you, these photoreceptors look pretty much the same in your eye and in a snake's eye, in a bat's eye. They all look the same, a fish's eye. Nothing like this in these animals. We also looked at the molecular components of vision. And we can pick out any number. There's many, many, many molecules that are part of the visual molecular apparatus in those photoreceptor cells. We found essentially none of them. We found a couple of players, but they're players that are players in a lot of different sensory cells, not just light detectors. So the short of it is, 
these are not simply a modified visual photoreceptor cell that's doing this um, infrared imaging. So comparison of the eye and the pit organ, very, very different organs. So now we want to look in that pit organ and see if we can figure out exactly how it is that they're detecting that infrared radiation. All right, so again, the pit organ is an invagination in the face, and the detectors of that infrared radiation are located in this very thin layer, this very thin membrane right at the back at the base of the pit organ. So we're going to look there and try to figure out how this thing operates. And once we know something about how the pit organ operates, we want to understand how that information is conveyed to the brain and through the brain. And I'll come back to this diagram uh, in just a bit. But before we go there, at the pit organ itself, we were wondering what kind of molecules might be involved. And so about the time that we really started in on this in earnest, a class of molecules had recently been discovered and it was really exploding. They were discovering more and more of these molecules all the time and they're called trip channels, transient receptor potential channel. In cells, you have a membrane that bounds that cell. It's basically a bag of water. And the membrane that surrounds that cell is actually a double layer of fatty molecules, phospholipids. And embedded within those phospholipids, these yellow balls with these little red tails, embedded within that membrane are tons and tons of proteins that do a whole variety of things. One of these types of proteins is this so-called trip channel. It has, we understand their sequences and they sort of loop back and forth through the membrane. And ultimately you have four of these proteins that congregate together and form this ring-like structure that penetrates the membrane and has a pore in the middle. This is why they're called channels. They actually allow ions like calcium or sodium or potassium to move in and out across that membrane. And it's those ions that we use in every nervous cell in our body and for that matter every muscle cell in our body to control their activity, to control their functions. So all the stuff we do, all the thinking, all the movement is simply based upon regulated movement of ions from one side of the membrane of these cells to the other. The reason we focused on these particular types of proteins, there are many of these channels, that many, many. We've known hundreds of them before this time. So these recently discovered trip channels, though, were very fascinating. The very first one, does anybody, anybody ever heard of these? Do, what, do you know one? I mean, the, I've you, a lot of these. Yeah. Ah, well, well, these trip channels, there's a class of them. The first ones that were discovered, very first ones, uh, well, the most famous one is called the capsaicin receptor. Who knows what capsaicin is? the hot in hot pepper. Yeah. So what? It's a chemical sensor. But our brains perceive that as hot. Guess why? The same molecule that detects the hot in hot pepper is in these neurons in your skin and detects temperature. Our brain perceives that hot in hot pepper as hot because it's the same molecular mechanism and to some degree going to the same parts of the brain as thermal information, heat information. So when people discovered these capsaicin receptors, we just said, wow, that's pretty cool science. But as soon as somebody said, oh my gosh, they're also in your skin and that's how you detect heat, we said, ah, maybe these things are the things the snakes are using. But still they've got to be different if they're there because what these snakes are detecting is far different from what we detect. I can detect a warm object or a cool object if I touch it or get close to it. These snakes are looking out there and seeing each one of us and the difference between the tables and the floor. So this is something really different. Anyway, this group of trip channels began to grow and grow and grow. There are so-called A-type trip channels, M-type, V-type, many different types. And in each one of these classes, there are many different types. So we didn't even, we, we really couldn't quite figure out where to start. We focused on a couple of them. We got some data on a couple of them, not very promising. And then, as happens in science, uh, we got scooped. One of my graduate students who was hot on this work had gone to Japan to learn some techniques that we were going to bring back here to Florida Tech. And he's sitting in a hot tub in Kyoto with one of our Japanese colleagues who said, over some sake, I suppose. He said, Bill, 
I've been trying to figure out how to tell you and Dr. Grace this, but um, one of our other colleagues back in California is about to publish a paper. And I know because I reviewed that paper. And the title of the paper is something to the effect that we've discovered the molecular mechanism of thermosensation in snakes. So poor Bill was about to drown himself in the hot tub. He called me from Japan. Oh my God, you're not gonna guess what I just heard. Um, said, calm down. Uh, we actually began collaborating with this group. Um, and together we've really done great things. What they did was really help us out because they discovered evidence. They didn't prove that a trip channel was involved and they didn't prove which one was involved, but they provided good evidence for one called trip A1 as the molecular thermosensor in the snake. Really strange because this diagram shows us that trip A1 in mice and rats is known to respond to very cold temperatures. We're talking about something that responds up in this range. So we were focusing on this trip V4, for, for example. We now believe it really is trip A1. In fact, we believe that maybe there are several different ones involved, and maybe these snakes even have something akin to color vision. They can detect different temperatures using different ones of these molecules in this pit organ. So anyway, um, Dan, let me know if I'm waxing on too much. Of course, you don't know that I still have 70 slides left. I'm, I'm kidding. But. Uh oh, I better turn mine on. So what we're going to do is ask whether these trip channels are molecular thermosensors, and if so, which ones, and uh, can we prove not only that they're there, but they're actually functional. So we've done some really cool work um, recently on this. Um, a lot of this is, well, most of this is not even published yet, so you guys are really getting the, the, the first look at it. So the diagram in the upper left is a, a pit organ cut in cross section. And through electron microscopy, we know where the terminals are, these nerve terminals that do the sensing of this infrared radiation. They're down here in the base of this pit organ. And we used a technique known as immunofluorescence. Our bodies make antibodies to fight off infection. It turns out those antibodies are extraordinarily specific for the types of molecules that they target, very, very specific. So what we scientists do these days is we actually trick animals into making antibodies that we want, antibodies that will recognize the proteins that we want to target. And then we can take a little blood from those animals, spin out the red blood cells and platelets, and you're left with serum. And you can use that stuff that contains these antibody molecules, put it on tissue, and you find some way to label it, to give it some color. And you can find out very, very specifically at a subcellular level, exactly where the proteins are that you're looking for. So we made an antibody that recognizes a synthetic TRYP-A1. We had some sequence of this so-called TRYP-A1 protein from an alligator, actually. We didn't have any from snake. We did a little, studies in the, a little study in the snake. We believed it was pretty similar and pretty similar to chicken. So we thought this little bit of sequence from this protein might be the, the one to target. So we injected some in some rabbits. Those rabbits made antibodies. We harvested the antibodies. And we put them on this piece of tissue from a snake, a very thin slice of tissue. And this is the bottom of the pit organ. The blue is DNA, so we can tell where the cells are, where the nuclei are. The green is the labeling for that trip A1. So you got trip A1, an antibody tagged onto it, and this green fluorescent molecule tagged onto that. So everywhere you see green is where the trip A1 is. These little green blobs are the terminals of those infrared sensory neurons. We tried a variety of other proteins, including trip channels, and we don't see them there. Um, interestingly, though, we do see two others, one that's called trip M8 and one that's called trip V4. And we think that, again, this might be the basis of some form of multi-spectral detection color imaging of the thermal world. So what we've got here in Python and in Pit Viper, done a lot of studies like this, we've got very good evidence that this trip A1 protein is actually out here in these, um, in these terminals of these neurons doing the, the sensing. But just because it's there doesn't mean it's actually functional. So we wanted to have some sort of measure of, of responsiveness utilizing this protein. So we went to a technique that's been applied perhaps to some of us, but has never been applied to a snake. We took uh, some of our really huge Burmese pythons, 
to a medical laboratory and put them in an MRI machine. So MRI can give you these really wonderful images inside the body. Functional MRI is a, is a type of MRI in which you actually look at the activity of cells and tissues. So what we're doing here in this experiment is trying to image the brain. This is the snake's brain, the forebrain here, the midbrain here, the hindbrain and the brainstem. This is the spinal cord. These large masses are the huge muscles that these snakes use when they clamp down on your arm or a mouse or whatever it might be. Um, these are the eyes here and here. Um, so what we wanted to do was use this functional MRI to detect changes in activity of neurons in a live snake, an anesthetized live snake, that's exposed to objects of different temperatures. So a lot of words we don't need to worry about. So what we've done here on the right, we've got a snake in the MRI machine. He's anesthetized using a drug that doesn't interfere with these sensory systems. And we block the pit organs on one side of the snake's head and we give a thermal stimulus to the other side and ask how the brain responds. Now, based upon some work just trying to trace where those neurons go in the brain, we believed that information from the pit organ goes back to the same side of the brain into this region of the brainstem known as, there's going to be a test on this, the nucleus of the lateral descending trigeminal tract, right? And you can't just write LTTD, but that's what I'm going to call it. So there's this region called the LTTD that we've done a lot of work on. It turns out it's unique to these infrared sensing snakes. They have this special part of the brain that's processing that infrared information. So information we believe goes there, solely based on anatomy, cutting brains, looking at them. And then from there, it goes to this region called the optic tectum. And we believe all the information from one side stays on the same side in the LTTD, and then it all crosses over to the opposite optic tectum. It's in the optic tectum where this information actually merges with visual information from the eyes. So in that part of the brain, they have a map of both infrared and visible space at the same time. They're literally seeing the world in heat and light at the same time, all processed as one. That's what we think we know from anatomy. So what we did here was an experiment in which we tested two things. One, that anatomy, to find out if we're right, first functional test of that. And second, we wanted to test the role of these so-called trip channels. So the images in the upper left show the brain imaged at two different levels. At this level, we're looking at the LTTD, and at this level, down here, at this level, we're looking at the optic tecta. So what we did is cover one side, heat the other side, and ask how the brain responds, and it turns out that you see if the left side is stimulated, the left side LTD lights up relative to the right side, so same side. And then the opposite side, optic tectum, lights up relative to the opposite side. So we have confirmation using a physiological measure of brain function of this anatomical pathway that we believed existed in the brain. So now we know a little bit more about how these animals are conveying this information and how they're processing it. The second thing we did was in an animal that was treated exactly the same way as the other, and we'd actually do a series of tests to begin with, just like I just described. But then we would put a little bit of a chemical on those pit organs, the pit organs that were exposed to heat. We put a chemical on there that we believe would interfere with the function of that trip channel. We tested this in cells in a dish, and it works great. If you've got trip channels in these cells in a dish, it responds to heat. If you put on this chemical, they stop responding to heat. So we put this chemical in those pit organs, and we put it in a mixture of dimethyl sulfoxide, DMSO, you might know from the sports world, and some other things to try to get it through the skin. And guess what happened? Under normal conditions, the left side LTDD lights up, and the right side optic tectum lights up. If you put in this trip channel blocker for trip A1, not the others, you turn off the activation of the LTTD and the optic tectum. So what we've got now is a physiological measure of function. We see the pathway of information flow and we have direct evidence, functional evidence, that this trip A1 
is the mediator of infrared sensation in these snakes. So this is a huge advancement. Um, nobody, nobody had any idea even how to approach this for a long time. So we finally have a good handle on how things are working. We've done a lot more experiments along those lines, but since it's getting late, I want to quickly show you one other type of experiment, just because this stuff is fun and weird. One of my graduate students, um, Sherry Emer, she came to me some time ago, had a little bit of background in animal biology and a little bit of background in psychology. She came to me just after I saw a talk at a meeting where this woman had trained sea turtles to tell the observer what they were seeing in terms of um, polarized light. Is this polarized or is this not? So she, she used psychological techniques. You may know the psychological technique of operant conditioning. She trained sea turtles to push levers with their fins to tell whether or not the light they were perceiving was polarized or not. She was trying to determine if sea turtles can see polarized light or not. Maybe they use it as a navigational cue. Turns out they can. Her results were so wonderful, and I just thought, oh my gosh, you can train a sea turtle to do this stuff? Um, turns out you can train honeybees and trout and all sorts of things to do some pretty complex things. But we thought, well, when Sherry came to me and said, I'd like to do some work in your lab, I said, oh my gosh, you're not going to believe what I just saw at a meeting last week. She came down to visit. I told her all about this stuff. She got all excited. I said, yeah, but I don't think you can train a snake. There's no way. I mean, what are they going to do? They don't even have arms or legs. Um, so we talked to this woman, Cordula Mora. She's now a great colleague of ours. And Cordula said, well, of course you can. And we said, no, 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 you don't understand snakes. They have this problem, this problem. She said, no, of course you can. And we said, no, no, but you don't understand. They're like this, they're like this. She said, no, of course you can. And Sherry, who's kind of bullheaded, I was ready to say, okay, never mind. But Cordula said, you can do it. Sherry said, I can do it. So she built this apparatus for training snakes out of duct tape and cardboard and aluminum foil and had some really good success. So in the end, we built a very nice apparatus. I wish we had a good photograph of it with some very specialized electronics, some nice uh, Peltier elements to generate the, the heat signatures that we want and some buttons that snakes could push. You're not going to get snakes to push buttons. Well, it turns out that she got snakes to push buttons very well. You put the snake inside this thing and they, I should tell you where these snakes come from. These are Burmese pythons. We go down to the Everglades and collect wild Burmese pythons. And we work with a lot of snakes, and some are aggressive, some are not aggressive. These things are vicious. They are the worst snakes I've ever seen in my life. They will bite your head off. They are just nasty. Shirley is about half my mass. She's a tiny little girl, completely unafraid of these snakes. These, some of them are giants. They're 15, 16 feet. I mean, they can swallow her, I think. But she is, she's really the snake whisperer, knows how to deal with them, knows how to handle them. In very short order, she first got those snakes to transition from eating giant meals, they were used to eating raccoons and rabbits and things like that, to eating tiny little mice, like just barely, I don't know, half grown, not adults. That alone I thought couldn't be done, but she did. And the reason why she needed to train these with a food reward over and over and over again to get them to learn how to do these behaviors. And you don't want them to eat one giant meal and be full and not come back and try again for two or three weeks because they'll forget. So she got them to eat these very small meals. And then she got them to go into this apparatus and take their meals. And then she got them to go into this apparatus and put their head on a little piece of carpet, otherwise smooth floor, and sit there and face a particular direction and watch this wall and wait for lights to turn on. And when the lights turn on, they say, oh, it must be time to make a choice. And then another light comes on that says, go make a choice. And they do. And guess what they do? They go push a button. And if they push the right button to choose the thing that she trained them to do, a door pops open and a mouse pops out and they eat it. And then what they do is they circle around and put their head right back on the carpet and wait for another one. And Sherry's even found out that if she's not quick enough, they'll go over and start pushing the button and pushing the button and pushing the button to try to get another mouse. So it is, a, and these are wild snakes. So snakes aren't as dumb as we might think. This is an example of a nice big fat Burmese python that's eaten about a hundred little mice in the last few weeks. And these are some of the LEDs that she uses. These are the two push buttons. In this case, she's got a single stimulus source. Uh, this is off, this is on with an infrared sensitive camera. So when it's on, it's warm. 
or it's cooler than background. It's a source we can make cooler or warmer. And it works like a charm. These snakes do all sorts of crazy stuff. They'll, they'll, they just work like crazy for us. Um, she tested to make sure that the snakes were using their infrared sensors to detect this object. Normally, the snakes average about 75% correct choices. They're not perfect. 75 doesn't sound all great, right? That's a C, but I guess that's about as good as our average student, so, you know, not bad. It's actually very good. You would expect, if they were choosing between two push buttons, on average, if they weren't detecting the right thing, they would make about 50% correct choices. Consistently 75%, the error bar is very tight. Um, if we cover the pit organs with clear packing tape, which we actually tested using an infrared spectrometer, all the infrared goes through, the snakes do perfectly fine. They still target as normal. If we cover the pit organs, though, with electrical tape, which we tested, and the infrared radiation does not get through, they drop to guess where? 50% chance responsiveness. And then if we remove that tape, they go right back to normal, start targeting normally again. Anyway, I won't tell you too much more about this. We, we're publishing some papers now, but the short of it is uh, just working out the techniques really amazing. A lot of people are, they just can't believe we can train snakes to do this. Um, We've used it for a variety of different kinds of experiments. For example, she's used it to test that smallest thermal differential that the snakes can detect. And she's gotten it down to less than half a degree, maybe about 0.1 degree. Um, it's, it's down to the limit of our system. We can't, with our sensors right now, detect anything smaller than that. So um, we believe, based on some other evidence, that they actually can detect approximately 0 0.003 degrees C thermal differential, a few thousandths of a diff degree difference between two objects. They're really amazing at what they can do. Um, I'm going to tell you something else about this. Oh, she also used the system to test the role of that trip A1 as well. If you put that inhibitor of this trip A1 into the pit organs, these animals go from about 75% correct to 50% correct. So again, we multiple mechanisms, we think we've identified that molecular thermosensor. So, why does all this matter? Who should care? We like snakes, so what? Technology is one thing. This is literally the best infrared detecting system on the planet. There's nothing else like it. There are some very good artificial ones, very good ones, and there are a variety of technologies that go into this, a variety of detection mechanisms. Nothing, even if this weren't the best, it's different. It operates on completely different principles from anything else we've designed. So, there's a whole field known as biomimetics today, taking the principles and sometimes the materials from biology and applying them to develop new techniques, new technologies, new materials for um, human applications. So, <clears throat> we envision, if, the more we learn about this system, we might be able to come up with new kinds of sensor technologies. For example, a body scanner that could detect very, very minute changes in blood flow that might signal the earliest stages of cancer, skin cancer, or, or perhaps even deeper, but harder to imagine. So some really good uh, technological applications. And the other one I want to tell you, there's a lot, but the two I want to focus on are technology and ecology. This is one of our snakes and one of our friends in the Everglades. That's a Burmese python. That is not a, bur a big Burmese python. I don't know, kind of a late youngster, maybe a young teenager. They get much, I've seen them 400 pounds. And the map shows some years ago the sightings around the states of Florida, so they really are a big problem, and they're not going away. There's no way we're ever going to eradicate them, I guarantee you. So anyway, understanding how this system works at least help us understand the threat that they pose because they have a sixth sense, if you will. They're armed with something that most snakes around here don't have. Snakes are already a formidable predator anywhere, and this makes them, being giants and having these heat sensors, makes them far worse than um, anything else that we've ever faced before. So just for fun, in case you're wondering where all those pythons and the Everglades came from, everybody says it's because people release their pets. Um, a crib is just plain worthless. So this is the real truth. If anybody asks you where all those snakes came from, come on. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. I hope it's interesting.
And if you'd like, you're welcome to come up and see some pit organs. This guy's got a nice array. This is a green tree python from northern, northeastern Australia. And he's got a nice array of pit organs around town.